this is Jimmy Powers, ready to bring you another story from The Tumult and the Shouting. This is Jimmy Powers transcribed with another chapter from the Grantland Rice story, The Tumult and the Shouting. Today, Granny takes us back to Atlanta, Georgia, where Granny watched a 13-year-old youngster swing a golf stick. It also began an association that was to endure right up to Granny's farewell in July 1954. So, with a warm salute to the every young spirit of Granny Rice, I take up the narrative in first person. <laughs> One lovely spring day in 1915, I stood with Alex Smith and Long Jim Barnes, both golf champions, watching a 13-year-old kid playing a mashy shot to the green. The youngster hit a good, crisp shot to within 10 yards of the cup. Immediately, he threw his club in disgust. Barnes's eyes opened. Who is that boy, he asked. His name is Jones, Bob Jones, I replied. I've known him since he was a three-year-old. He's the son of a good friend of mine, Bob Jones Sr., a fine lawyer here in Atlanta. I played baseball against him while he was at Mercer University and I was at Vanderbilt. It's a shame, Alex said, but he'll never make a golfer. Too much temper. Why, that was a fine shot for anybody. I disagree, said Barnes. This kid will be one of the world's greatest in a few more years. Look at him, broad-shouldered with big, strong hands. I've got to agree with you, Jim, I said. At 13, he's already playing low in the 70s. He isn't satisfied with just a good shot. He wants it to be perfect, stone dead. He has a great ambition to play every shot in the bag right. But you're correct about that temper, Alex. And that one fault could prove his biggest hazard. If he can't learn to control it, he'll never play the kind of golf he'll be capable of shooting. When Bobby was five, he started swinging a golf club. His family lived just off the 13th fairway at Atlanta's East Lake course. At the age of seven, he was swinging a mid-iron with better form than the average club champ. Who started him? Himself. But the fellow he often pestered was the club professional, Stuart Maiden. Bobby would watch Maiden impart his wisdom to a pupil, then go off to one side and practice. The boy had a large head on a smallish body, and the head served as a perfect anchor for those shots that later would flow so flawlessly from his club head. As a result, by the time the kid was 12, he had hung up a 70 at East Lake. He had grown from a rather sickly-looking kid into a chunky, broad-shouldered youth with thick, powerful wrists and big, strong hands. At 12, he could drive 240 or 250 yards. When Jones arrived at Philadelphia's Marion Golf Club for his first crack at the amateur title in 1916, he was 14 and a half years old. I was then 36 and writing my column for the New York Tribune Syndicate, having left the New York Mail in 1913 at the invitation of Mr. Ogden Reed's offer of $280 a week. Bob and I had breakfast together the morning of his first match round. Having qualified the previous day with a miserable 90, he was to meet Eben Byers, a sound golfer and a former amateur champion in 1906, 10 years earlier. Byers, also hot-tempered, wasn't adverse to wrapping his own hickory shafts around the neck of the nearest tree. I mentioned this to Bob. 
I recall one hole particularly in the Battle of Tempers that followed. It must have been the fifth. Byers was straight down the middle. Jones hooked way off the fairway into deep rough. After a short delay, Byers hit his second shot and started walking ahead. Jones, deep in the rough, called out, Four, Mr. Byers. I'm sorry, Byers responded. I thought you had picked up. Picked up, snorted Jones. You just watch this one. The recovery shot stopped about four feet from the cup for a birdie. That was a large measure of satisfaction for the hot-blooded Georgia kid. He won three and one because, as Jones put it later, Byers ran out of clubs first. That evening, after finishing my overnight, those Georgia papers were thirsty for Jones' copy. I had my own qualms about Bob's going very far. He had all the shots, but his temper was on the verge of throwing him. Next day, however, a self-controlled, strong-willed Jones went out and defeated Frank Dyer four and two, and it was this round that earned him the first of the tremendous galleries that were to become a Jones trademark. Bobby was eliminated in the third round by the defending champion, Bob Gardner, on the 31st green. A year later, in 1917, young Bob and his Atlanta pal, Perry Adair, were sent north to play several war relief charity matches in and around New York City. Bob's dad rode ahead asking me to sort of keep an eye on the youngsters. Kid, of course, insisted they stay at our apartment at 450 Riverside Drive. One evening, I took the entire brood to Coney Island, a great trip. We didn't miss a ride. It was during their stay that Bob and I became acquainted in a way few persons with a gap of 20-odd years between them ever do. All of Bob's friends during the early years, his dad, O.B. Keeler, his ever-faithful Boswell, and myself, among others, had admonished Bob concerning his temper. But it took the British Open of 1921 to expose it to Jones in a manner he never forgot he had committed the unpardonable transgression of picking up his ball and thought of it rankled him throughout the next nine years, years incidentally, when the Bobby Jones deportment remained at a magnificent standard. If temper had been Bobby Jones's major flaw, a minor one concerned his diet. His appetite between morning and afternoon rounds was voracious. A fighter, football player, even a baseball star, with the eternal exception of Babe Ruth, goes light on the chow going into battle. I remarked as much to Bob. Nevertheless, he continued to cover the noon menu pretty well, including his pie a la mode. During those on-trial years leading into the Open in 1923 at the Inwood course on Long Island, he was being beaten off in the final rounds more often than not, and Jones was becoming a touch fatalistic about those defeats. Nuts to fate. I replied when he mentioned the subject following his thumping at the terrifically hot hands of Jess Sweetster in the 1922 amateur at Brookline, Massachusetts. You eat like a ditch digger at noon and then wonder why you don't have that extra feel in the afternoon. Many a hearty lunch has cost thousands of golfers a good round later on. However, I believe it was Bob's closest confidant, O.B. Keeler, who convinced Jones that a drastic switch in his noon meal might mean more than a hot putter. From 1923, the year he won the Open for the first major title, until the end, eight years later, Jones stuck to a lunch of crackers and milk. During that span, in which he picked up 13 major titles, it was strictly a case of Jones against the field. Looking back on the Bob Jones story, there were, in my opinion, two critical shots on which his entire career hinged. The first came at Inwood, Long Island in the 1923 Open. As I said, the big ones had been escaping him somehow, and he was giving serious thought to law and the practice with his father's firm. The open field was a roaring good one, and at the end of 72 holes, Jones and Bobby Cruikshank were tied. Cruikshank was a 10-7 favorite in the playoff. What a match. Attack, attack. Hitting into a headwind, Bobby Cruikshank tried to keep the ball quail high below the breeze. He hit a half-top drive that hooked into the rough. Jones's drive was long and hugged the right side, finally landing in a soft spot at the edge of the rough. Cruikshank then played the only possible shot, a recovery short of the lagoon guarding the green. What to do? Should Jones play it safe from his own poor lie and shoot for a tie on the hole and bank on wearing down his little adversary in extra holes? Or should he give it the big gamble going all out to win or lose the title on the strength of one attacking shot? 
Bob studied the ball a moment before grabbing his midiron, a treacherous club, even on a good lie. The club flashed back and down. The club head tore into the ball. It drilled straight into the swarming storm clouds, a speck of white arrowing over the lagoon and drilling onto the green 190 yards away, then up, up to within five feet of the cup. That settled it. Bob Jones, open champion, was on the way. The other vital shot, a putt, occurred six years later in the 1929 Open at Mamaroneck, New York. Jones was leading Al Espinosa by four strokes with four holes to go. Then Bob Blue, sprinkling sevens around like Rockefeller with a pocket full of dimes. At the 72nd hole, he needed a four for a tie. Jittery, he left himself a mean 12-foot side hill putt. With the angel of doom looking over his shoulder, Jones took his Calamity Jane putter, stroked the ball, and made it. If I'd missed that putt to drop what had been a four-stroke lead and the tournament, said Bob that evening, I hate to think of what might have happened to my confidence. And without confidence, a golfer is little more than a hacker. Next day in the 36-hole playoff with Espinosa, Jones won by 23 strokes. Well, that's our transcribed story for today. And now this is Jimmy Powers inviting you to join us again next week. And until then, the mostest of the bestest.